For those of you tuning on online, we will be starting shortly. Thank you. Testing, testing. Okay. <clears throat> well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Leadership Institute. I'm Wharton Blackwell, president of the Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our uh, May Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. Uh, we, we live in interesting times, and it's easy to focus on things uh, as individual, unrelated uh, instances, but it's interesting sometimes to look back and see how current events fit into long-term trends. Uh, back in the 1960s, there was building an, an intellectual base of conservatives. We began to call ourselves uh, the conservative movement. In the 1970s, there was an explosion of new conservative and uh, pro-free market activities, uh, existing organizations that were highly respected earlier suddenly became mass-based in, in the 1970s, and the whole idea was, are we going to build a movement that is committed to limited government, free enterprise, strong national defense, and traditional values? Uh, that uh, coalition, I think, did become a movement and resulted in the nomination and election of Ronald Reagan, and the question that would be appropriate to think about today is, is that, that movement still healthy? Um, that is, will those people who favor limited government, free enterprise, and uh, uh, traditional values and strong national defense, will it uh, con continue in the future? And we might think about the events of the last uh, 24 hours in, in that regard. Um, the, uh, the, the question is, can such a political uh, combination uh, continue to function well? Will the various elements of the coalition feel that, that they are being treated f fairly? Um, and if you think about these events uh, of the last couple of days, uh, I think the signs are that the coalition is going to hold together. Will the traditional values people think that they are being well treated? Well, did you have a look at the draft of the Supreme Court decision? Um, and did the efforts of the movement, which coalesced behind uh, Trump, did they have a, uh, a worthwhile effect in the hands of, the, in the minds of the, uh, the grassroots activists? Then I think the answer is the three justices appointed by Trump voted in a way the traditional values people uh, wanted. Um, and the events in the Ohio primary yesterday, I think also uh, were worth studying in, th in this context. 
I encourage you to live tweet today's event. The hashtag is here on the screen. Um, you, you can uh, use that to bring others into what we are doing. There are a lot of people who are uh, regular attendees via our online presentations each, each month. In 2022, your Leadership Institute has already trained 3,711 conservatives and free market supporters at 156 separate training programs already this year. And since 1979, the Leadership Institute has trained 246,655 activists, students, and leaders. You have before you our schedule uh, for, for programs in the coming months. I urge you to take a moment to review these schools and consider attending one or sending a friend to one of our trainings. If you are watching online, visit our website at leadershipinstitute.org slash training to see upcoming online and in-person training. And now I uh, I'm happy to introduce Jalen Steele. She'll offer an invocation and pledge of allegiance. She is a donor operations officer here at the Leadership Institute. She was recently hired just after completing an internship at the Institute in our communications training division. She is from Manhattan, Kansas, <laughs> where she recently graduated from high school. Jalen served on her high school's student council and actively educated other students on conservative values and election integrity. She owns her own screen printing and apparel company called Steel Appeal. And in her free time, she enjoys watching Friends and playing with her four siblings. Jalen? Also, please be with everything going on in our country. And please be with um, all of our countrymen serving. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please rise with me? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I am have the great pleasure of presenting to you Stephen Rowe, known well to most in this room. Stephen is the Director of Digital Training here at the Leadership Institute, and he has trained more than 18,000 activists, students, and leaders in digital and political technology. He has been listed on multiple uh, uh, 30 under 30 uh, uh, awards. His work has been featured on Fox News, uh, Fox Business, um, where are we here? Well, I knew it was happening. Oh, here it is. Here it is. At the Daily Caller, the Washington Times, Breitbart, Daily Wire, and more. And he deserves all that attention. Stephen grew up in Montana, otherwise known as the Treasure State. Uh, come give us a program's report. And uh, good morning to everybody. I hope that your days are going well. Happy Wednesday. Certainly been a, a pretty productive week. I think big news on Monday, uh, huge news on Tuesday. And uh, Wednesday, let me be the first to say, may the 4th be with you. Uh, you're going to get that a couple more times today, I'm sure. You're plenty more times. But I'm here because thanks to Morton's leadership, uh, 
the Leadership Institute offers the best digital training program for conservatives across the world. Uh, so far in 2022, uh, conservative activists in all 50 states and more than a dozen countries have been able to participate in a training at a time and place most convenient to them. And earlier this year in February, we transferred to a new platform and our website is leadershipinstitute.training, leader, uh, www.leadershipinstitute.training. Certainly encourage you to check out all the amazing training opportunities that we have for you there. Um, from introduction to Adobe Photoshop to our campaign academy, there's a tremendous amount of training designed to equip you with the skills necessary to be successful. Almost all of our training is low cost or no cost thanks to the generous and dependable support of our donors. But there's one training in particular that I wanted to highlight here today, and the training is one that you've probably heard of before but still could not be more important. It's Leadership Institute's School Board Campaign Training. And our school board campaign training will give you the skills necessary to design, uh, create, and execute a winning campaign strategy for a local school board race. And maybe it's you who wants to be that school board person for the young people in the room. Most of the time, all you have to be is 18. Um, for the older people in the room, uh, really encourage you to step up to the plate because we have seen consistently across this country, when we step on the gas pedal, this is an issue where we're winning. Um, there's a lot of great victories to mark over the past several years. One of my favorite ones is in South Lake, Texas with Hannah Brown and Cam Bryant, uh, who won in a 70 to 30, which is in, in political speaking, uh, just a total landslide victory. Three times as many people voted in that school board election because it was focused on CRT, mass mandates, and the conservative response to it than in a general election. So we're seeing tons of support. One place you wouldn't expect it was Minnesota in Waconia County, where uh, the school board, uh, of course, in Minnesota was leaning a little bit more uh, to the left, um, tried to impose mass mandates. And it's tough to imagine this. Imagining a child getting up at seven o'clock in the morning, putting on that mask at 7.30, and aside from drinking water and eating food, not taking that mask off until they get back from that school bus later that day, five, six o'clock in the afternoon. It's totally unacceptable. And those parents thought so too. And they used effective organizing strategies to attend that school board meeting and pressure that school board to remove those mask mandates. And now those students can go to school with the mask if they choose to, but people are not compelled to do it anymore. And more recently, in April, we saw a bunch of elections happening in Wisconsin. And uh, Wisconsin was a huge, huge victory for many conservative candidates out there. Um, in Waconia County specifically, uh, they won every single election, but almost every single election, I think minus three or four school board races went to conservative candidates. And again, these people are effectively trained how to organize. And we certainly know that political technology determines political success in the words of Morton Blackwell. So I certainly challenge you uh, to either check out the school board campaign training, at least watch that one with Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz is in it and he's awesome or refer it to a friend, it's totally free, it's available online at a place uh, most convenient to you, whether it's your phone, uh, when, you're, when you're commuting back and forth to work, or maybe it's your laptop after you put the children to bed, um, this training is available for you and for others to succeed. Uh, so with that, thank you all so much and, and hope you enjoy the breakfast. Thanks, thank you, Stephen. As you can tell, he's a great communicator, and we very often hear after the training programs, uh, the host organization will say, we want you to come back, but make sure that you send Stephen Rose again to teach. He really does a great job. Our digital trainings keep conservative and libertarian activists on the cutting edge of political technology, and I, I am pleased always to thank the generous donors who increasingly contribute to make these schools possible. And I can tell you the Leadership Institute has been setting records year to year uh, in, due to the generosity of our donors. And uh, once again, in this year, we're running considerably ahead of our, re our revenue budget. And now let me present to you Matthew Hurt, who will introduce our speaker. Matthew Hurt is the Director of Graduate Programs at the Leadership Institute, where he maintains connections with Leadership Institute graduates and supports their growth and leadership skills. He's also an internationally recognized fundraiser, organizer, writer, and public speaker, working for more than 11 years in the movement uh, and at several uh, conservative organizations, Matthew has 
trained tens of thousands of activists here at our institute and across the country. Come introduce our speaker, Matthew. Thank you, Morton. And to build on Stephen's point, my home county of Rutherford County, Tennessee, had uh, its pr county primaries last night. And uh, there was a school board race uh, in particular in the Republican primary, and the incumbent, uh, a woman by the last name Johnson, lost handily. Um, and the guerrilla campaign that was run against her, uh, she had, you know, four by four signs out across the county. And next to her signs, there were these other signs that said, this candidate forced masks on your children. Um, and you may have seen the, the image online. I saw it circulate a few times during the cycle. And, uh, and so she is now an outgoing member of the school board in my home county. Um, this, is a, this is a special treat for me. Uh, as a young regional field coordinator for the Leadership Institute in 2009, I helped start more than a dozen Young Americans for Liberty chapters across Kentucky, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and my home state of Tennessee. With esteemed nonprofit executive experience, Lauren Doherty has operated within the Liberty Movement for well, excuse me, for over a decade. Lauren began her career right here at your Leadership Institute and at FreedomWorks. Shortly thereafter, Lauren became Interim Executive Director and Director of Development at the National Libertarian Party, where she built their fundraising and operations capabilities. Throughout her career, Lauren has served as an executive, grassroots activist, writer, publisher, entrepreneur, candidate, campus organizer, church leader, wife, and mother of two boys. But what you may not know about Lauren is that in 2015, a group of bikers were meeting on a Sunday afternoon at a restaurant in Waco, Texas, a town I'm sure many of you have heard of. A few bikers had an altercation in the parking lot. Law enforcement was on site and gunfire erupted. Nine bikers were killed. 18 others were wounded. An overly zealous district attorney and justice of the peace decided to arrest every single biker on the premises, regardless of whether they had done anything wrong. So they put nearly 200 bikers in jail and set bail at an egregious $1 million each even on those who were, only, who were running away from the violence. Lauren and many others saw this as a violation of their Eighth Amendment right uh, of these bikers. The Eighth Amendment, of course, protects Americans from excessive bail. This was ultimately acknowledged by the courts, and the bikers were released. Notably, zero convictions resulted from these arrests. Wacoans realized the unfairness of what happened. The DA was primaried and lost the next election, but no one would run against the justice of the peace, whom local lawyers called a made man and, quote, too powerful to run against. Lorne knew that if the justice of the peace was unopposed, it was the same as saying that the egregious violations of the biker's constitutional rights did not matter. No one else would run against him, so Lauren did. She ran a vigorous campaign and championed the principle that everyone's constitutional rights matter. And now she didn't win that election, but she did help transform the conversation around the Constitution in the town of Waco. Fast forward to 2021, and Lauren was selected to lead Young Americans for Liberty, the preeminent campus organization for pro-liberty students. Most important in her role as Executive Director for Young Americans for Liberty, Lauren is a staunch advocate for liberty and devoted to YAL's mission to identify, educate, train, and mobilize youth activists committing to winning on principle. Recently, Lauren served as publisher and CEO of Texas CEO Magazine, where she worked with executives from across the state of Texas to help grow their business and master the chief executive role. She also owns a small business called Evergreen Rapping, which I'm told is not a hip hop music venture. Lauren is a graduate of Emory University where she was chair of the Emory College Republicans. She then earned two master's degrees at John, Johns Hopkins University and the Institute for World Politics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lauren Doherty. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to Morton and Deirdre um, for organizing this today and to all of you for coming. So uh, Yal and LI have a proud history of working together uh, from our very beginning, actually. So uh, Yal was founded um, out of the, uh, the Ron Paul Youth Movement, 
but also uh, I, would, I would argue out of LI's campus program. Uh, so our founders were um, employees in, in, in LI's campus program and then went to work uh, on Ron Paul's campaign and then after that uh, they founded YAL. Uh, built out of all of the great uh, political technology and tools that they had learned here at LI. Uh, so we are, we are very proud of that, that heritage and we're very thankful to still partner with LI on dozens of training programs every year. As Matt mentioned, uh, I started my career here at LI, uh, but uh, even more pivotally in my life, I remember attending my first YLS when I was 21 years old. And I remember sitting in that it was in a boardroom uh, at, a, at a law firm, um, and I was there as an active member of the College of Republicans, and I remember thinking to myself, wow, this makes so much sense. What they're teaching makes so much sense. This, this is really practical uh, information that, that we, can, we can put to good use. Uh, and so that was a pivotal moment for me in my journey uh, that has arguably uh, led me to where I am today. Um, so I'm sure most of you are very familiar with Morton's uh, laws of the public policy process. Um, these are uh, things that get referenced by um, my staff on a regular basis. We, we cite them uh, and, and we cite them because they're so true and they're so valid. Uh, one of the, the ones that came to my mind as I was uh, preparing today is his saying that in politics nothing moves unless pushed. And that is kind of the summary of what we do at Yale. We help push. So uh, at Yale, we have a, a C3, a C4, and a sister PAC. And of course, all of those organizations are separate, but they all work together to the full extent allowed by law. Uh, but most simply put, uh, we apply the grassroots pressure on campus and in state legislatures to help make change. Uh, and, and what we bring to the table that's uniquely ours is uh, combining our students with our, our state representatives. And so they work together and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, and productive relationship. In 2018, we set a goal to build a coalition of state reps um, to 250 by 2022. And um, last year, 2021, was our proof of concept. So in 2021, 173 state reps from 37 different states uh, passed over 120 pro-liberty bills that made 88 million Americans more free. So that showed <laughs> the power of that concept. So we were very proud of that. And 88 million Americans turns into one out of four Americans. One out of four. So we're very, very proud of that impact. And it includes some very hefty bills like um, uh, school choice bill in Kentucky, uh, school choice bills in Missouri, uh, constitutional carry in Texas uh, so that you don't need a government permission slip to carry a firearm, uh, ending civil asset forfeiture in Maine. You know, very, very impactful, meaningful bills. So uh, this year, uh, our students uh, have already helped uh, pass constitutional carry in Indiana and Alabama, so we're very pleased by that. Our students are currently knocking doors in New Hampshire on a slew of different bills, uh, opposing uh, COVID-era you know, lockdowns and mandates, um, pre pre preserving uh, our freedoms there, uh, and they're also currently knocking on constitutional carry in Louisiana. Um, they're also, uh, through our PAC, uh, knocking on doors, uh, advocating for uh, uh, about 200 different uh, pro-liberty candidates this year. Um, so, so we're proud of our students getting out there and, and being the grassroots army uh, for change. If we execute all of these plans this year, uh, we very likely at the end of 2023 will be able to say that in 2023, our legislators were able to pass enough pro-liberty legislation to make 100 million Americans more free. Uh, so again, it is, it is a great joy and delight uh, to, to be able to have this kind of impact and this very rapid uh, progress uh, made. We've, we've got a beautiful combination of programs here that facilitate that. Um, but this is only possible because of the decades of work that have been done by other people like Morton and his team, who have laid the foundation and, and started this great tradition of training and teaching up uh, all of us on these tools uh, that work 
And uh, so when I look at these great numbers and this great success, I am very uh, humbled and thankful to all those who have come before us, uh, on, who have laid the foundation for us to do this, this uh, mighty work. Um, and just truly a team effort. So as Morton got up here earlier and talked about how this began in the 60s, uh, it, it, uh, it resonated with my heart because th this is something I think about on a very regular basis. And so thank you to all of you who have been part of that and continue to be part of that. Um, but I am a big fan of short speeches and longer Q&A. Uh, so with that in mind, um, I will uh, uh, stop here and, and open things up for, for Q&A. Yes, sir. I'm Dino Drudy from Alexandria next door. Um, you talked about making 88 million Americans more free. Mm -hmm. What can be done about the New Yorks and the New, New Jerseys and California, which at one time had a libertarian streak, but lately, what's gone wrong? Well, the, the left used to care about free speech, right? <laughs> and now it's the right who, who is uh, alone bearing that standard. Um, you know, times change, and um, it's heartbreaking to see what has happened in some of those states. And, and people are voting with their feet. They're leaving, right? And as so often happens, you see the pendulum swing, and it has to swing a long way before it finally swings back. And so I think that pendulum is just going to have to swing uh, for a while until it swings back. And, and there's a limit to, to what organizations like mine can do to help in those states just because of the reality is there. But, but I, I sympathize. Those Americans' rights matter, too. Um, and so, so uh, it, it's painful to see um, what has happened there, but I, I don't have a lot of hope in the short term. Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. I'm Pat Gibson. I live here in Arlington. Um, I'm curious as to what you're seeing in terms of this whole gender movement within the school and what sorts of things you've been finding as you're trying to combat that insanity that they're trying to teach our kids that they can choose whether they can be a boy or a girl. So that's not a topic that we at Yale focus on, um, but it is clearly one that uh, is becoming more and more uh, prevalent and concerning to people, um, but it's just not one of our core issues. Yes, sir. Hey, Lauren, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Minnick. I work in our campus leadership program in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, Young Americans for Liberty, they're absolutely killing it there. Um, it's more liberal than other parts of the country, and I think libertarians have done so well to succeed. Uh, my question is, with the recent news about the potential overturn of Roe v. Wade, how can college students talk about abortion, being pro-life, respecting states' rights um, on campus when it can be pretty tough, especially up uh, in New Jersey? Well. <laughs> So free speech is a, a, is one of our core issues here at Yale, and uh, you know we I, I didn't mention it in, in my talk, but we have a, a very proud uh, history of of making uh, changes for free speech on college campuses. We've helped overturn anti free speech codes on 99 different campuses, and this impacts over 1.5 million students every year. So I think that's part of the reason why those free speech codes matter so much, right? Um, and that's a perpetual ongoing battle uh, that we have to fight so that we can speak out um, on things in the future, uh, things we can't even anticipate. Um, I think it's also important that when we go and we talk about controversial topics, uh, we do so with respect um, and trying to reach out to other human beings and truly com communicate, right? If we want to win people over, we need to be able to communicate with them. Um, and if, if we're respectful with how we communicate, we have a much greater chance of being able to be persuasive. Uh, and so that's one of my uh, core values uh, as, as a, a person in this movement is, is uh, increasing the respectful dialogue so that we can help find common ground and try to make things better. 
uh, in the back. Hi, my name is Barbara Dello. I'm from. My name is Barbara Dello, and I'm sadly from New York. Um, I recently, you know, I've been campaigning a lot locally, and um, I was having no luck getting people to come to town board meetings about the um, um, uh, zoning, the new zoning and uh, that's coming out of HUD. And um, I was doing all the social media, all the right things, and I, it wasn't working. So then I went and I Xeroxed, um, copied uh, copies of the mission statement of the vision statement of the sustainable development people. And I put it in mailboxes of community leaders. And we had like 12 people come to the meeting. Um, so my question is, in working with young people, I've worked successfully in one group and I've had a lot of frustration in another area. And uh, is there, how can you establish a symbiotic relationship? Uh, is mentoring helpful? I have learned many things from young people, but there are some things that work, that I found that work. Um, so how can there be respect between the two groups in terms of learning from each other? And my, uh, this is just a piece of information for you um, about liberty. Um, I, my, my personal issue is end of life. That's what I did my thesis on, end of life law and the changes. And I gave a talk to it to a, a group of college Republicans. And I was surprised that over 50% favored uh, assisted suicide or euthanasia. Um, and uh, they were considering literacy and they were also considering being very athletic and fit. And they wouldn't want to live in a wheelchair. So uh, I thought that was a good piece of information for you to have regarding um, uh, how you uh, address liberty with young people. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. So were you asking about how there could be more of a dialogue and, and that relationship? Yes. Okay. So in my experience, um, young activists want to make a difference, right? Uh, that's why they do what they do. Um, when I uh, talk with our young activists, I often highlight what a difference just one or a few people can make. And, and through our programming, like that's part of what I love about it, is often it's just a few people making a, a huge impact, right, and helping turn that tide. Um, people want to be empowered no matter what age they are, uh, but especially when you're very young and idealistic, like that's what motivates you, right? So I would recommend speaking to that and showing them, hey, here's, here's the difference that you can make here because they want to make the world a better place. That's why they do what they do. So communicating on those terms, I think, is the way to reach them. Dan? Thanks. Uh, my name is Dan. Uh, I'm from Maryland. Uh, I'm one of the people who's had the pl pleasure to work with you, and I'm going to ask you a difficult question <laughs> because you're generally a humble person. But you carry with you an incredible reputation. In every place that you go, you lend that reputation to and you elevate it. How do you bring that element of leadership and disperse it among the people who are reporting to you? What have you done? that is making Yao so successful right now. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, yeah, it's a hard question. Um, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I care. I care very, very much. Um, I'm very genuine about everything I say and do. Um, and and I, I think people see that. And, and I think that that... Um, that helps bring along new people and additional people that, that care a lot, and I think it helps you know the existing team wherever that is. Um, but uh, yeah, this best answer I've got for you. But thank you, I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming. I'm Mike Hines from here in Arlington, uh, longtime uh, supporter of Leadership Institute. But you and Morton have both uh, referred to the state of the movement, mm -hmm. the conservative movement, as it is today, and given recent developments, I'd be interested in your views on that. How healthy are we as a movement? Absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I began working 
for the cause uh, r roughly 20 years ago, if you, if you count my time as, a, as an activist uh, when I was a teenager. Um, and so I, I've seen a fair bit of, I've had a fair bit of experiences in those, those 20 years, whether it's as a campaign manager, as a campaign uh, volunteer, as a candidate myself, as a nonprofit staffer, as a nonprofit manager, as a nonprofit CEO. Um, I've seen it from lots of different angles in lots of different areas. And what is most striking to me now um, is I perceive there to be a whole lot more teamwork than there was 15 or 20 years ago, you know, and, and of course I'm, I'm in different conversations now than I was 20 years ago, you know, um, now, now that I'm a CEO in the movement and I talk regularly with other CEOs in the movement, there is so much genuine, um, collaboration and, uh, teamwork and, um, I wasn't in those same boardrooms 15, 20 years ago, but there's, in my, in my opinion, there's a lot more collaboration and teamwork now than there was then. And I love that. I love that. And I think that that's what we need to really get out there, make a huge difference and succeed. We have to work together um, to make that happen. Yes, ma'am. On a sort of broader question, Yes, there's a lot more collaboration and teamwork among people who call themselves conservatives and think about it. But we have in the country for the last, I'd say, six to seven years, been undergoing a transformation as to who aligns with what political party. Mm -hmm. And I used to say five years ago, I wasn't sure if the parties would still have the same names by today. I was wrong. <laughs> but I'm just wondering, how does the movement interact with the tendency for the Republican Party to be more populist and sometimes less aligned with the traditional international security concerns that have guided the party in the past? Where does this come out as, there, as this churning of who aligns with whom goes on? I think there's always going to be shifting that that happens, right? And and when when you look at the the political map and the political math, it's a, it's a very small margin in the middle that both sides are vying for, right? And so, you know, there's there's going to be that tug of war, and and I don't think it we're ever going to get to a situation where it just kind of settles. I think it's just it's it's the nature of the the process, and it's frustrating because we d we don't like uh, as human beings we don't like change, right? Um, uh, but I think we should see that change um, a, a, as an opportunity, uh, even though it, it frustrates us at the same time. Frank? Hi, uh, Frank Lesby from Arlington. Um, do you find that the youth, especially on the college campuses, are they more willing to take on the, an identity of libertarian than, say, conservative? Because we all know the media is what they've done over the last 20, 30 years of vilifying conservatives. And mm -hmm. so I think a lot of youth just, they don't want to be a social. But do you, feel, do you find that maybe being considered a libertarian is something that they're more open to? I, th I think there's some opportunity there. And I think there's a whole bunch of us who consider ourselves both. I'm a, I'm a conservative and a libertarian. And, um, I, you know, th these terms, over time, they, they evolve in people's minds, right? And so if, if calling something by a different term makes people more willing to get out there and be active and make a difference, personally, I'm okay with that. Because what I care about at the end of the day is are we making progress on our values and our issues? Um, I care about that a lot more than I do whatever we call it. So one more question. Yes, sir. I used to work for Newt Gingrich on Capitol Hill, and he was a historian. And if you look at the last century, say, the left has won only about four times supermajorities. But most of the progress towards socialism has been done during those, those times. Mm -hmm. And there's an argument that the next time the left wins, uh, they're going to get rid of the filibuster, add some new states, pack the court, and then with overwhelming, with absolute power, they're going to wreck the country. And there's an argument that the way we have to deal with that is to take power away from Washington instead of just arguing about which politicians run it. And I wonder if um, you at, at Young Americans for Liberty have talked about that approach of taking power away from Washington uh, and, and how we might do it uh, to stop the left uh, the next time they win a majority. 
It's a great question. So at Yale, we focus on state reps. And the reason we do that, uh, a couple different things. Firstly, uh, state houses and state senates actually have a lot of power to influence people's, uh, people's lives, right? Um, and COVID taught us that too, right? All, all these, uh, these governors and, and, and the, uh, the local government um, had a lot of power. Um, so we, we celebrate uh, bringing more of that uh, power back to the states. Um, and we also celebrate reducing the power that government has over our lives. Um, because at the, the end of the day, uh, we want uh, to decrease <laughs> the, the influence government has on us, whether it's the federal government or state governments. Um, so absolutely, that, that's a key part of our mission um, is, is the states. All right. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for coming. Congratulations on your leadership of a, of a fine organization. Uh, I, I look forward to, to, to watching you continue to increase uh, in, in numbers and effectiveness in your organization, which in the early days, we sublet space here to uh, uh, at Young Americans for Liberty, and uh, we're here for a long, uh, long while. So thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you for what you're doing. And it's no surprise I'm going to present to you uh, a, a Leadership Institute Adam Smith scarf. Thank you. Thank you. I urge you to join us on June 1st for our next Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfast. And I encourage you to RSVP online at leadershipinstitute.org slash breakfast. Brian Klotz, will you please step up here? I invite anyone interested in a tour of our Stephen P.J. Wood Building and the next door Emerson and Dolores Wright Center for Campus Reform. Meet Brian up here as soon as we adjourn and he will give you a great tour of the Leadership Institute and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you all for coming today. <laughs>